Good morning. Good morning. Listen to all that talk about airplanes. Remind me of that fellow. I don't know if you saw that story this week. He flying back from the Bahamas and the pilot passed out and he didn't know how to fly. And he calls down to air traffic control and says, what do I do? They say, keep the wings level <laughs> and fly up the coast until we can find you on radar. And they talk the guy down. It's quite a remarkable uh, series of events. Uh, as I was preparing my last sermon, I noticed a scripture, as it were, for the first time. I'm sure you're no different than me. You can read something over and over again, and then one day, out of the blue, it strikes you as something new. Uh, as, as you look at it and you ask yourself, have I read this before? Which, of course, you know you have, but it is on that particular day that you're struck by it and become diverted from your initial studies by your interest in what it was you just saw. It was, it's with that in mind today that I'd like to take you on a frightening journey through my mind and tell you what diverted me so you can see how really frightening it is the way my mind works. And I hope you will find some in interest in it as I take you down the rabbit hole I found myself going down, all the while I should have been preparing another sermon. Let's begin in Numbers 18, verse 15. Numbers 18 and verse 15. It says here, everything that opens the womb of all flesh which they bring to the Lord, whether man or beast, shall be yours. Nevertheless, the firstborn of man you shall surely redeem, and the firstborn of unclean animals you shall redeem. When I read this, it was the idea that they were redeeming the firstborn of unclean animals that struck me as so interesting. I thought, wow, I hadn't really considered that they were redeeming unclean animals. Not only were they the redeem the firstborn of man and beast, which, you know, you think about the clean animals, but they were specifically told to be sure that they redeem the unclean animals. Consider for a minute the way they were told to look at unclean animals as it was with their relationship to God. Turn back to Leviticus chapter 5. Leviticus chapter 5 and verse 2. It's here that we find the instructions about the trespass offering. And Leviticus 5 verse 2 says, If a person touches any unclean thing, whether it is the carcass of an unclean beast, or the carcass of, an unclean, of unclean livestock, or the carcass of unclean creeping things, and, and he is unaware of it, he, is, he also shall be uh, unclean and guilty. So even though he didn't know it, he is considered unclean because he touched this unclean animal. You know, when you read the scripture like this, you can see how it was that the Israelites developed over time a similar approach to the unclean animals as they did to non-Israelites such as the Samaritans and the Romans at the time of Christ. They viewed them as unclean. They wouldn't touch them. Let, let's take a look at that, in, beginning in John chapter 4. John chapter 4, we see this story of Christ at the well. John chapter 4 and verse 5. It says, so he came to, speaking of Jesus Christ, it says, so he came to a city of Samaria, Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now uh, a Samarian woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And this is what's interesting is this verse 9. The reply of this woman, when you think back to Leviticus chapter 5, verse 2, where they shouldn't touch the carcass of a dead, unclean animal. It says, And the woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. They knew, she knew, that they would, she couldn't touch the cup that Christ would drink from in a normal circumstance. The Jews would not allow that to happen. Then go to verse, or chapter 15 of the book of Matthew. Matthew 15, and we'll begin in verse 21. We see another story 
this time Christ with his disciples. And we see this interaction this time with a woman of Canaan. Matthew 15, verse 21. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Get this, send her away, for she cries out after us. I mean, push her away. But Christ answered and said, I was not, to the woman he's speaking, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to little dogs. Again, you see this psychology. Of course, Christ knew that Gentiles would be called, but this psychology of the world they lived in. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And then Jesus answered, had great compassion for her. He said, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desired. And from that hour, her daughter was healed. So on my journey, as I am meditating about the redemption of these unclean animals, thinking about how they looked at other human beings as unclean, and I was going through this, it struck me to think about and to look up the story of Peter on Simon the Tanner's roof and the vision of the unclean animals that he saw and how culturally God was revealing to Peter and to all of us by extension that things were about to change. Turn with me to Acts chapter 10. and We'll bounce through this story a little bit. Acts chapter 10. And beginning in verse 10, we'll set it up with what, how it begins here in verse 10. It says, then he, speaking of Peter, became very hungry and wanted to eat. You might remember he went up onto the roof of Simon the Tanner's house. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and an object like a great sheath bound from the four, by the four corners descending to him and let down to earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And And a voice spoke to him again a second time, What God has cleansed you must not call common. And this was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven. Now, you might remember, I'm not going to read all the verses here, but between verses 17 and 21, Peter is contemplating what is this all about. He's not going to eat unclean animals. What are these unclean animals all about? And then in verse 21, we find that the men who were coming from Cornelius had arrived. And when they arrived, they stood at the gate and called out is for Peter because they knew they weren't allowed to enter the house, which we'll see here in a minute. There were actual physical laws that prevented them from interacting with one another. Drop down to verse 27. And Peter, of course, he goes with them to Cornelius, and it says, as he talked with him, Peter talking to Cornelius, he went in and found many who had come together. And then he said to them, get this, you know how, you know how unlawful, It is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another's nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was asked for. So now let's come all the way back to where we began in Numbers 18, verse 15, where the Israelites were told that they were to redeem unclean animals. You shall redeem them. God says. For Peter and those who he'd be talking to shortly when he gets back to Jerusalem, it must have been an eye-opening moment when the scales fell from their eyes and they could look back on these scriptures in the Old Testament referencing unclean animals and see that there was a broader meaning, that they were to be redeemed. Turn with me to Mark chapter 12 and we'll see this principle of revelation It isn't about Gentiles here, but it is an interesting 
point, it says, have you not read this scripture? And then he quotes Psalm 18, verses 22 and 23. The stone which the builders rejected have become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it was marvelous in their eyes as they understood that Christ was going to be the chief cornerstone. This revelation of understanding a scripture they probably read and read and read, but now fully understood was marvelous in their eyes. And indeed it was, and it is in ours as God has opened our eyes to see it. In this case, here we're talking about the unclean, God was opening, as they called it in that time, the way to the Gentiles. He was opening, he was going to give his Holy Spirit to the Gentiles, and they were going to be part of the family. I wonder for them if this revelation concerning or understanding the clean and unclean people, not that this sheath of animals had anything to do with the consumption of food, that's a misrepresentation and an error, but that it represented that all people are clean in a sense that you can't call them common, caused them to contemplate the scripture that struck me and led me down the rabbit hole, the things about the unclean animals that they may not have considered before. For me, this led me back to Exodus chapter 13, verse 11. Exodus chapter 13, verse 11. So far, we've seen a compare and contrast between the Israelites seeing themselves as clean and seeing others as unclean in the way you would look at food. Exodus chapter 13, beginning in verse 11, is actually the, the scripture that caught my eye first and led me to Numbers and to the other places. Exodus 13, verse 11. And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers and gives it to you, that you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb, that is, every firstborn that comes from, a, from an animal which you have. And the males shall be the Lord's. But get this next verse. But every firstborn donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. Very specific. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And all the firstborn of man among your sons shall you shall redeem so now i'm thinking so what's the deal with the donkey what's the deal with the donkey why is this donkey here why are we breaking its neck if we don't want to redeem it there must be something to this flip back to exodus 34 it's repeated this command almost verbatim exodus 34 verse 19 through 20 it says in verse 19, all that open the womb are mine, and every male firstborn among the livestock, whether ox or sheep. But the firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem him, then you shall break his neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem. So as I take you along with me through the maze of my mind, down my mental rabbit hole as I'm trying to digest what all this means, by the way, as I said, I should have been working on another sermon and I wasn't really giving it the attention because I was following this string. Why is this so important? Why was this left, and not just left once, but left twice, very specific to a donkey and breaking the donkey's neck, if you will not redeem it? Let me give you some information about the donkey uh, as it is related to scripture. You might be surprised to know that a donkey or in the King James Version, the authorized version, is known as an ass. And it is mentioned more than 90 times in scripture. That can vary, of course, depending on the version of the Bible you are reading. And many times, it is not only mentioned as unclean, but it has great value. The donkey is represented in value. Let's take a look at the Ten Commandments, because the donkey is in the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, Verse 17, Exodus 20, verse 17, we read the 10th commandment. You shall not cover your neighbor's house, you shall not cover your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, 
or anything that is your neighbor's. We see here the donkey is thrown in here and these other things are thrown in here and things that would have been of value, they would have represented value to the people of that time. Of course, the scripture is larger, the command is larger than the animals. It's talking about coveting and you would naturally covet things of value. When I was looking at this at first, I thought that this scripture about the donkey was a parallel with stubbornness for which the donkey has a reputation. As the instruction for the redeeming of the donkey proceeds in the verses that we read, the description of the stubbornness of Egypt. Let's take a look at that. Let's go back to Exodus 13 and complete. We'll pick up in the last verse, verse 13, where we left off and complete the thought or the command that God left Israel about the redeeming of this donkey. It says, but every firstborn, this is what we read, every firstborn of the donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, and if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck, and all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. Why? Verse 14. So it shall be when your sons ask you in the time to come, saying, what is this that you shall say to him? By strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, but the firstborn of man and the firstborn, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Well, as you can see, it ties together quite nicely. It it seems to fit, and it does partially fit that the stubbornness of these people, and it seems to say that's why you either redeem the donkey or you break its neck. But as I learned as I was looking at it, to slow down, not so fast, I couldn't get past the fact that Christ rides into Jerusalem, not on a horse, he will return on a horse, but he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. Could there be more to this donkey, this unclean animal, and this command? As it turns out, there is. Let me take you a little bit further along my journey to see if you think and find that this incredible verse has some very deep and pertinent meaning to Christians in our journey today. Most commentaries I read concerning the donkey, as portrayed in the scriptures, concur with a synopsis that I found on Wikipedia. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not... I'm not advocating Wikipedia, but I read a lot of commentaries and I thought the way this was condensed was very nice. It says, in contrast to Grecian works, so without boring you with it all, in Grecian works, the donkey is portrayed as being very stubborn. It says, in contrast to Grecian works, donkeys were portrayed in biblical works as symbols of service, suffering, peace, and humility. They are also associated with the theme of wisdom in the Old Testament story of Balaam's ass and are seen in a positive light through the story of Jesus Christ riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. As I said, I'm not a big fan of Wikipedia, but I thought that this was a very good summary of the commentaries I read, and it turned my thinking around about this beast of burden and made it added to my curiosity to find out more about it. If you have the authorized version, you'll note that the word for donkey is ass, not donkey. The term donkey is fairly recent word. Its first known usage dates back to about 1785. One article I read said that its origin is likely related to the description of the dun color of the animal's hide. Before that time, the donkey would have been known as an ass, and if it were a male donkey, it would be a jack. I won't go there because it's a pejorative in the world we live in today, but Jack meant male and ass was the animal. It is believed that due to the use of the British and American slang term for a person's rear end promoted widely the acceptance of the use of donkey in place of ass. Further, the article I read said it is possible that the improper or negative connotation of the word ass for the animal has given many people the wrong perception of the character of the donkey. Many thinking when it refuses to move, perhaps because it senses danger, it will sit on its rear end. 
and that way that leads them to believe the donkeys are stupid and stubborn. However, that is not the case. I read an article, which I'll read a part of to you, by Mr. Graham on CGG.org. He gave the following description of the character of a donkey, which I thought was pretty insightful. He said the following. They are anything but stupid. In fact, once their owners gain their trust, they can be willing, companionable partners and very dependable. It is said that they are they it is said that they actually do not work their best unless they trust the one they are working for. Once they feel comfortable with the owners, donkeys will do almost anything within their limits and as a bonus, they need minimal training. Being sure-footed and having excellent eyesight, they are able to navigate rocky desert terrains and find paths that the human eye may not even be able to see. They will actually lead the way without having to be guided. Another trait the donkey possesses is an acute predator detection instinct. He says, for this reason, many modern farmers are adding them to their herds as guard donkeys. Having a keen sense of smell, along with excellent hearing and the aforementioned excellent or exceptional eyesight, they are quick to sense predators, sound the alarm, baying wildly. Even more, they will uh, position themselves between the predator and other animals they are protecting. They have been known to kill foxes, coyotes, and even mountain lions with their sharp hooves and powerful kicks. He finishes by saying, the donkey has been perceived as a stubborn animal, but many experts believe that is because the donkey has such strong su survival instincts that it is difficult to get them to do something that they perceive as dangerous. So with all that in mind as a background to what this animal is, let's go back to Exodus 13 and verses 13 through 15. I'm not going to read through them again. We've done that, but let's just pick out a few points. In verse 13, we're told that the firstborn donkey shall, you shall redeem with a lamb. It's very specific. It doesn't say that about the other animals. This one must be redeemed with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, it's a choice. You don't have to redeem it. But if you choose not to, you must kill it. Then we're going, it goes on, as we read, to say so that you can tell your son why these things are done, and it speaks about the stubbornness of Pharaoh and Egypt in verse 15. So is this scripture a reference to the stubbornness of Egypt? Well, I think you'd have to say in part, yes, it is. I think they connect very well there. And I think that is how exactly how the Israelites saw it. I read an article on one Jewish uh, website explaining this command here in the Old Testament in, in uh, Exodus that this was needed, this donkey, this represents the need to redeem the mixed multitude that came out with the Israelites out of Egypt. That because they were not Israelites, this redeeming of the donkey pictured them and that's what this was about. If this is how Jews today look at it, we can assume it has long been their perception that the unclean donkey pictures only the redemption of Gentiles that are willing to convert to Judaism. But having a greater understanding through the Holy Spirit, we have to ask ourselves questions. Is that so? I had to ask myself, what is it I thought this was about? What was I seeing as I dug into this command about redeeming the donkey? My conclusion, the donkey, the unclean animal, represents all of mankind, not the mixed multitude, not the Gentiles, all mankind from Adam and Eve on. We all, man, all of we, all of mankind are the property of God. While Adam and Eve were not created unclean, they became so through their sin and those, who born, who those of us born afterwards are likewise unclean. Once Adam and Eve had chosen the path of unclean, they went against God's will, if you will, represented by the unclean donkey. God had a choice to make, redeem us or break their necks. There was a choice. 
Thankfully, from the foundation of the world, as Mr. Kasharik spoke about in his split sermon, God, they, God the Father, and the one that would become Jesus Christ had predetermined that the answer would be redemption. You don't have to turn there, but in Genesis 3, verse 15, right away after this happens, we see this prophecy. It says, he, meaning Jesus Christ, shall bruise your head, God says to the serpent, and you shall bruise his heel. As we just pictured in Passover, the Lamb of God must stand in our place, redeeming us so we are not found, so we are not found without a worthy substitute, leading to the command that our necks be broken, that is, death. It is only by a lamb that a donkey can be redeemed, and it is only by the Lamb of God that all of mankind has the possibility of redemption. When you think back to the instruction, it's optional. They could choose to redeem the donkey, or they could kill the donkey. It was optional. A lamb for a donkey. You know, it must have been difficult for some people to make that choice. I can't even picture breaking a donkey's neck. Personally, I think I would get killed before the donkey would. But you could make that choice. Which do I value more? As I was meditating on that choice, I got to thinking, and this is speculation, but I could imagine Satan must have convinced himself or could have convinced himself that the Father and Christ would weigh the two options after Adam and Eve had sinned. And in his demented thinking, thought that there's no way that they would redeem the donkey, that they would break its neck. Thankfully, and like all of his demented thinking, if that was the case, he was in error. They chose to redeem us, unclean animals, and by us I mean all of us, as Mr. Kshark talked about, all those in the world today, unclean animals, by the, by the death of a, something of so much greater value, a lamb, the lamb of God. Given the weight of what has been done, this redemption of we donkeys, we should ask ourselves some questions, particularly as we approach Pentecost, and the associated offering when, if you will, these leavened bread that is waved on the day of Pentecost to before God the Father, representing us, sinful mankind, the two loaves are waved, being presented at that time, representing us as being redeemed before the Father. We should take the time in this 50 days that's offered to us between the holy days to think on this and ask ourselves some penetrating questions about our deep appreciation for all that has been done. I'd like to take two characteristics of the donkey in the time remaining and take a look at those and see how they can apply to this great gift that we've been given, this redemption and furthermore God's Holy Spirit. The donkey's characterization as a stubborn creature can be rightly prescribed to it. But as we read, not for the reasons of unwillingness to serve its master, but rather the care and the protection of the master himself. If you were asked which way would you describe your stubbornness, is it to do the will of the master or is it to fight the will of the master? To this end, our stubbornness obviously must reflect doing the will of the, of the master. Let's take a look at the story of Balaam and Balaam's ass, or at least part of the story, this remarkable story where God allows his beast actually to speak in Numbers chapter 22. Numbers 22, we're not going to get to where Balaam's ass gives him a good tongue lashing, but we'll read the first part and look at the character of this animal, this beast. Numbers 22, beginning in verse 22, it says, Then God's anger was aroused because he went, that is, speaking of Balaam, going to see Balak, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside to the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey and turned her back on the road. Stubborn donkey, do what you're told. 
Then the angel of the Lord stood in the narrow path between the vineyards with the wall on this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against the wall. And he struck her again. And then verse 26, then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in the narrow place where there was no way to turn, either to the right hand or the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she laid down under, ba under Balaam, laid down on the ground, and Balaam's anger was aroused, and he struck the donkey with his staff. It is the strength of this donkey's will to do the right thing that is so impressive. Here it was for Balaam which is the strength God wants us to have on our path, on our journey as we go along and God reveals to us what he wants from us. He wants us to have the will of that donkey. Our path, like the path of Balaam's ass, is full of dangers. And we, like this donkey, need to know when to stop and assess the situation. And if danger exists, go no further. As we just pictured in the keeping of the days of unleavened bread, reminding us of the dangers of sin that are all around us and the need to stubbornly keep it out of our lives, the putting of leaven out of our lives, putting this sin out, just like the donkey's stubbornness to see to do the right thing, in this case for Balaam, his master. My brothers, I don't remember this myself, but my brothers always, uh, when they speak about my mother, they now a donkey, a mule is not a donkey. It is a cross between a donkey and a horse. But they used to always say about my mother, when the mule sat down, the mule's done sat down. And when it came to religion with my mother, when she sat down, that was that. My wife, very similar. I mean, when it comes, this is the way we keep the Sabbath, this is the way we keep the Sabbath. You do what you want at a certain age. But when the mule's done sat down, as Patrick would say, she, she sat down. And that is the stubbornness that God wants us to take from this animal that had to be redeemed by the lamb. Secondarily, we read that, the, that a donkey is sure-footed and knows the path to its destination. Conversely, we firstfruits, like the firstborn donkeys, having been already been redeemed or in the process of redemption, must ask ourselves, are we sure-footed on our path? I'd like to read to you six scriptures. I'm not going to ask you to turn there because I'd like to read them, not rapid fire, but in succession without turning and pausing because I think they go together very nicely. They bounce back and forth between Psalms and Proverbs, and they speak about the path that we are to be on, the sure-footed path. And it is God the Father and Jesus Christ who have set this path for us. All we must do is follow it. I'm going to begin in Psalm 37, verse 23 and verse 24. We're told the Lord directs the steps of the godly. That's us. He delights in every detail of their lives. I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, but that's a remarkable thing to contemplate. He delights in every detail of our lives. He is thoroughly involved. It goes on to say, though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. Proverbs 16, verse 9. Proverbs 16, verse 9. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Psalm 31, verses 14, and part of verse 15. Psalm 31, verse 14. But I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. Proverbs 20, verse 24. The Lord directs our steps, so why try to understand everything along the way? I love that one because I fail at that all the time. Give up. God has got it in his hand. Psalm 19, Psalm 119, 105. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light to my path. Psalm, or Proverbs 19, verse 21. Many are the plans of a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. This idea that God has set us on this path, that he is with us, that he has us by the hand, and that he knows and he purposes for us what that should be is so reassuring. Turn with me to Isaiah 48. In Isaiah 48, there's a scripture 
to me that coalesces this idea. Um, Isaiah 48, we're going to read verse 17. Isaiah 48 and verse 17. It says here, it says, Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, the one whose blood was shed for you donkeys. If you are to redeem the donkey, it must be with a lamb, the lamb of God. Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way that you should go. The path is set. All we must do is stay on it. We have been redeemed. We have been redeemed like the donkey. With meekness and sure-footed stability, we must do, all we must do is stay on the path which God has set us on. We are on that path today in our Christian walk. And in a small way, we are on a similar path right now, 50 days as we walk between the spring holy days and the day of Pentecost. The next step in the path of our master. The next way station along the way as we travel. Picturing the acceptance of us by the Father, by means of the redemption of the Lamb pictured at Passover. The Lamb was redeemed for all of the donkeys. So there you have it, a journey through my frightening mind and how it was while I was studying for one thing, I got thrown off track because of a donkey. How it must have been for the disciples. Think about it. And they came to the understanding of exactly who Jesus Christ was, not only while they were walking with him, but more so after his death. And the Holy Spirit was given to them. And they could have a full appreciation for scriptures, such as the redemption of the donkey. Peter on that roof, thinking about unclean, unclean animals being lowered. He knew it wasn't about food, but he couldn't quite figure it out yet. It was God was going to reveal something to him that all unclean animals were to be redeemed. He could look back now on these scriptures because he now saw that the Gentiles were going to be part of this. I didn't do the math, but some 3,500 years ago, they were at Mount Sinai. I believe that's right. Somebody can Google it and correct me, but I believe that's about right. Um, they were at Mount Sinai, and God left this instruction. Think about it. He leaves this instruction and all the things he's talking about, okay, and the donkey, this is how you handle the donkey, right? To them, this was a command. This is how I redeem a donkey. They're not told how to redeem anything else that specifically, but this is how you redeem the donkey. And they did it. And I suppose observing Jews would do it even to this day, 3,500 years later. And yet they don't know what it really means. They can't see why that's there. As we approach the day of Pentecost, Let's be sure to give, take the time to give God thanks for his Holy Spirit, which allows us to see the true complexity, the miracle of things, and even in small ways, in one or two verses in the Bible, left to us. What, otherwise, to the ancient Israelites, I said, as I said, it would just have been a command. But to us that have the eyes to see, let us see these things in the deeper meaning that God left them for, like the breaking of the donkey's neck, and that I loved you so much that I redeemed you with a lamb, you dumb donkey. I have redeemed you, all of mankind. I love you so much. As we, appre as we approach the day of Pentecost, those of us who have been given God's Holy Spirit now in this age, who will be there to help others to understand the same things in the world tomorrow, let us give thanks and praise to God with deep, deep meaning during these days as we approach Pentecost, the day on which the Holy Spirit was first given to the church.